Hello everyone, this is Mr. Caviani, and by the end of this video, you should be able to identify and explain the properties of projectiles, determine the location and velocity of a projectile at different points in its trajectory, and apply the principle of independence of motion to solve projectile motion problems. Before we begin, what is projectile motion anyways? Well, projectile motion is simply the motion of objects thrown or projected into the air, subject to only the acceleration of gravity. This could be a soccer player kicking a soccer ball, a tennis player hitting a tennis ball, a basketball player shooting a free throw, an archer shooting an arrow, basically anything that travels through the air um, in two dimensions. So we call this object a projectile, and we call the path that it takes through the air its trajectory. In this class, we will only be considering two-dimensional projectile motion, such as that of a football or another object for which air resistance is negligible meaning the air doesn't really have an effect on what the object is doing. When we think about solving projectile motion problems, it's important to keep a few things in mind. The first is that we can't deal with things traveling in two dimensions at the same time, but we are very familiar with how to deal with things moving horizontally and things moving vertically. So what we can do is we can split our projectile motion problems into horizontal and vertical motion. And we know that these forms of motion are independent of each other. We proved that in our lab. This means that we'll also want to split our initial velocity into components, x and y components as well. Now, if we're dealing with a projectile that's launched at some angle above the horizon, then we know that velocity is a vector. We know how to break vectors into their respective components. Um, it's also important to note that the time, this is the time, that that object is in the air is determined completely by the vertical motion, right? Gravity is accelerating that object towards the Earth, and so it will be in the air for as long as the vertical motion allows. And this time is the same for both vertical and horizontal motion, right? The object's in the air just as long horizontally and vertically, so we can use time to connect the two uh, directions. Uh, we know that the acceleration in the horizontal x direction is zero, right? Um, you can see that in this diagram on the right. This vx is the x component of the velocity. Notice it's the same the entire time the projectile is in the air. In other words, the projectile has a constant horizontal speed. We demonstrated that in our lab as well. And we know the acceleration in the vertical y direction is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And this explains why a vector launched with some initial positive y velocity will eventually see that velocity decrease until at the maximum height, its y velocity is zero. See, it's missing there. And then on the way back down, that velocity slowly becomes increasingly negative. So we see that negative acceleration represented here on the right. Um, which, again, brings me to my next point, that the y velocity at the maximum height here, you'll notice there is no y vector there. That's because it is zero. There is no velocity in the y direction at the maximum height. That object has stopped in the y direction. Again, it's still moving horizontally, just not vertically. Okay. Um, important to note, right, that our initial and final velocities will never be zero for this problem, for any of these problems, unless you're talking about the final velocity at the maximum height. Otherwise, when we launch the projectile, it has velocity, and when it hits the ground, it has velocity we always end our problems right before it hits the ground. So you'll never say that the final velocity is zero unless you're talking about the maximum height. Last thing to keep in mind when solving problems is if you're ever asked to solve for a time when the object reaches a certain height, like let's say for example right here, you'll notice that for projectile motion, the motion is symmetrical. So on the way up and on the way down, that object reaches the same height at two different times, right? This could be my first time and this could be my second time. So when you're asked to solve for time, you'll often use the quadratic formula. You'll get two roots. They'll both be positive. The first root is when that object reaches that height on the way up. The second root is when the projectile reaches the, that height on the way back down. So just something to consider when you're solving these problems as well. Okay, now before we conclude this video, um, we're gonna discuss the motion graphs for both X and Y position, velocity, and acceleration. Now, before we begin, I'd like you to take a moment, pause the video, and see if you can sketch a prediction for each of these graphs before moving on. Okay, so we know that in the 
x direction, this object, a projectile in the air, is traveling at a constant speed. It does not accelerate. And therefore, our graph looks something like this, right? A linear uh, trend, constant slope here, where again, this slope, this is my velocity in the x direction, and it's constant. That means my x velocity um, for a horizontally launched projectile will be something like this, right? Where this is just my velocity in the x direction. And notice, right, if I were to pick two times here, time initial, time final, my velocity doesn't change. And so my initial velocity and my final velocity in the, the x direction are the same. Then my x acceleration will be zero, right? No acceleration, okay? Then in the y direction, my position looks a little bit different, right? On the way up, the object is slowing down. On the way back down, the object is slowing up and it does change directions. And so I represent that with an upside down parabola. Right here, right? This is where the velocity in the y direction equals zero and you can tell because the slope there is flat. Um, this is also where the object changes directions. So right at that moment in time, that's where the object changes directions. On the way up, right, is slowing down. And on the way back down, it speeds up again. So my y velocity will look like this, like that. There we go. And it's important to note that this time, right, so this is when the y velocity is zero, right? It corresponds to the same time over here. But this is also when it changes directions. And I can also tell that because up here, the velocity is positive. Down here, the velocity is negative. And so I, I've changed my direction there. And in this case, my y acceleration is a constant negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Gravity is the only force acting on this object. In our next unit, we'll learn more about forces. But for now, just know that because gravity is the only force acting on this object, the only acceleration it has is in the y direction, and that's equal to negative 9.8 meters per second squared. All right, so when it comes time to solve problems dealing with projectile motion, we can use the same approach we've been using for kinematics so far. Except in this case, we're going to make a clear distinction between the vertical and horizontal direction when we're solving our problem and when we're writing down our given information. I'm gonna go ahead and write down our kinematic equations uh, indicating a y for the vertical version and an x for the horizontal version. My first equation relates the y displacement to the initial velocity in the y direction, time, and the acceleration in the y direction. My second equation, this one relates the final velocity in the y direction to my initial velocity in the y and my acceleration in the y and my di y displacement. Again, I'm showing all the y subscripts to be very explicit that this is in the y direction. And then my last equation relates my final initial velocity and x y acceleration. Now in the x direction, we have, again, the same equations. These are not new equations. These are the same ones we have. But I'll show them with the x subscript. Um, notice something interesting. In each of my kinematic equations in the x direction, I have this acceleration in the x term. But I know that my acceleration in the x direction is 0. So actually, all of these terms go away. And these last two equations end up being very boring. Uh, it just tells us that the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity. Yeah, we knew that. So it turns out we only have the one equation. I'll erase the rest here. The displacement in the x direction is equal to the initial velocity in the x direction multiplied by time. And I can go even a step further. I know that this initial velocity in the x is just equal to velocity in the x. It never changes. So I'll just say that delta x equals v sub x times t. And there you have it. Those are all of our kinematic equations. You do not need to memorize these. Obviously, these are the same equations we already have, just written out very explicitly. Now, the plan when it comes time to solving these problems, first step is always separate our x and y information, info, and motion. So we'll want to take our given information and keep track of it. Which one's horizontal? Which one's vertical? What do we know? Our second step will be to split our initial velocity into initial velocity in the x 
an initial velocity in the y. Anytime we have a projectile launched at an angle, we have to break that into components first to get those initial velocities. And then the third step will be the same to guess a problem solving process that we've known so far. Um, we'll just keep going through each step, looking at our equations, see what we have, see what we don't have, and then plan a way to get to what we need. So this is no different at this point than everything we've done so far. Just a quick word before you begin solving these problems. It's really important to be very comfortable with your calculator uh, in this class especially, but beginning now. Um, please make sure your calculator is set to degrees mode always. Um, get it out of radians if it's in radians. Uh, it helps to store intermediate values. By intermediate values, I mean anything you're going to use to do a calculation again later in variables in your calculator. You can look for the STO or arrow symbol to do this. And if you've got a question about this, you can always come talk to me and I can help you with that. Um, it's also very important to use parentheses in your calculator and be careful about your order of operations. I can't tell you how many times students are confused, they're not sure what they're doing wrong, and it ends up just being that their calculator is not doing things in the order of operation that they think because they are not using parentheses. So please always group your numerators, denominators, any square terms, use parentheses, and be careful. And last thing is see if you have a quadratic formula solver on your calculator, or um, you can always use the NumWorks online graphing calculator. This is actually allowed on all of our exams. Um, if you have a physical version of this, it's allowed on the AP exam as well. Um, but there is an, a tool on this calculator. You can see it right here. It is the solver tool. Um, this will actually allow you to solve a quadratic formula without doing it by hand, although I would know how to do it by hand as well. Um, I've linked this calculator on Canvas, and there's also a free app for iOS and Android, um, just in case it's something you'd like to look into. But again, you don't have to use this. You can always just do the quadratic formula by hand.